as far as whether the roller is hard or whether the roller is soft or what the surface looks like. The most important part of the roller in itself is the roller surface. And a roller surface, what's a new roller look like? It's not smooth. A lot of people tend to think that the roller is very smooth and, and perfect surface. It doesn't, it's not smooth at all. It looks like this. It's, it's, it has a nap, so to speak. It's what we, it's the mountains and valleys of the roller. Those mountains and valleys are a little bit like fingers and agitators, if you think about it at will that way. Um, the surface is what provides the uniform ink and water distribution on our machine. We all know that printing is based on the theory ink and water do not mix, but we also know in the world that we live in today, how we print today, the speeds that we print today, we do have to have some degree of ink and water emulsification. The ink and water need to be mixed uh, to some degree on the printing press at all, all times. This surface is what allows us to do that. This surface is what gives us the ability to maintain our ink and water balance on the press. So ultimately, this surface is the single most important dynamic factor as far as the roller is concerned and the ability to print on a daily basis that there is. We can talk about how hard or how soft, but a, a hard roller with a really good surface like this will print much better than a soft roller with no surface. So it becomes pretty important that we take care of that surface. How do we know that that nap is even there? The easiest way to tell that the nap is there, that the surface is still good condition, is just a finger test. Basically, we put our finger down on the roller, we put a little pressure on our hand, and we push our finger away from us. Our finger should stutter and skip across the face of the rubber. It should not slide easily and smoothly across the roller. If it does, we've lost the surface. It'll also probably look very shiny. So the roller should have a very dull appearance and, and a matte finish, and it should be very almost tacky to the finger to, the, to push your fingers away from you on the roller. So it's the easiest way to tell how the roller is conditioned, how it's aging, so to speak. So we talk about cleaning a roller. We talk about on that, that roller surface and why it would change and how it would change and those kind of things. Well, what's a dirty roller actually look like? What does it look, what, we call it glaze. Glaze is uh, essentially what goes on on the roller surface that creates problems for us uh, when we're trying to print, takes away the surface. What does it look like? Uh, this is a picture of the same roller surface. Um, picture on the, the left is the brand new roller. Only 20 million impressions to get to the picture on the right, the dirty and glazed surface. Uh, it's a pretty dramatic change. Takes away the nap. You got to have the nap to carry the ink and water. Uh, the glaze takes away any ability to maintain ink and water balance. Creates all kinds of different problems. Creates things such as dot gain because we can't lay a, a smooth dot. We're just smashing the dot against the plate with that hard flat surface now. Um, takes away the ability for the roller to rebound. That can create issues for us as well. We have to have the roller be elastic. It becomes like an eggshell on the roller. So a lot of different things can occur because the roller is dirty than because the roller is not. Um, there are more rollers replaced in the United States every single year just because they are dirty um, as opposed to a roller that's being worn out. And that's a fact in just about every press room uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast. It's just kind of a fact of life. Uh, rollers get dirty. People don't take care of them. And then they replace them because they think they're having a roller issue. And ultimately, they're replacing them because they're dirty than because they are uh, because they're they're worn out. So why does the surface change like that? What actually is occurring there? We think about glaze and what it's made up of. It's made up of dirt particles. It's made up of three dirt particles. Essentially, the, the number one is solvent soluble particle. Uh, roller wash can break it down. Water soluble items such as water can break it down. And then insoluble items. And those are the things that are left over after the solvent and the water have done their jobs and they're just insoluble and and they're not breaking down, so they're being left behind. So we have a brand new roller, and we have nice high mountain tops, and we have nice deep valleys. And then we start doing things such as putting ink and water and paper through our press, and all of these things start to build up down in the valleys of the roller. And as they build up, each contaminant builds up all, layer upon layer until it gets to the top of the mountain tops. That's when we have glaze situation. That's when we lose the ability to maintain ink and water balance. It's when we lose the ability to maintain uh, consistent and high-quality printing, so that becomes an issue. So when we clean with a roller wash, what we're essentially cleaning out is the solvent-soluble particle, the little red triangles, right? So that's great. What are those? Those are the things essentially in the ink. Uh, the, the only thing that the roller wash will remove are the, is the thing in the ink. In other words, the vehicle of the ink, the varnish of the ink, the pigments, those kind of things. That's what the roller wash is going to remove but we're still stuck in the end with the water-soluble and the insolubles. 
So we introduce water. Water is an integral part of any wash-up that we do. Water is going to remove the water-soluble items that are in the press, things like gum arabic from our, our fountain solutions or our plate preservers, these kind of things, whether it be gum arabic or whether it be a synthetic type gum. Uh, things like dust and coatings from the paper. We all know the paper's not quite as uh, a good today as it was, say, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, we see it on our printing blankets as we're running our presses. We see how much buildup is coming from the paper there. If we need paper, if we need water to clean the paper coating and things like that off of the printing blanket, then we need to have water to clean our rollers with. Water, water, water. Water is an integral part of any wash-up that we do. And we'll talk more about that as we move along. But again, we're still stuck with solvent soluble and insoluble by, by just adding the water in there. So what should we use to clean the rollers with? What we recommend, we recommend a water miscible roller wash. In other words, a solvent that's readily mixable with water. In other words, if you put the two in a bottle together and you shook them up, they would form a, a white emulsion. They would, they would stay mixed. They wouldn't separate immediately. Um, you need the water to introduce into the solvents because it actually activates the detergent and the cleaning sides of the solvents, and especially in today's world with the newer type washes that are out in the marketplace. Um, you see any of the new machinery that's out today, they, they have recommendations that are calling for what they call FOGRA approvals. Uh, the FOGRA approved washes are very high flash points. Um, when, our, when we start using them right away, we, we immediately find out that they don't dry quite as well. They seem to be oily. Um, people have the, the inclination that they don't clean as well. A lot of times it's simply based on the fact that they're not using enough water. Um, water activates the detergent and the cleaning side of the solvents and makes them clean better, makes them dry faster. So they need to be mixed and they need to be mixed on the rollers at the same time. So that's a key factor right there. We're still stuck with insoluble still. Even if we do a good job with our water miscible wash and our water, we're doing a good job getting all those things out. We still have at least as a minimum we have insoluble particles left. And those insolubles, what are they? There are things that come from mineral deposits like from hot, from uh, hard water. They come from clays and fillers. Again, we're right back to the paper. Um, paper coatings are, are full of filler and clay and these things won't go away. We're just using roller wash and water. They're still stuck and left inside the uh, nap of the roller deep down in the valleys. Soap residues, a lot of a lot of soap residue being left in presses. Now, soap residues come from a myriad of different places. Uh, one place they come from is, is uh, water miscible wash, believe it or not, because of the surfactants that are in there. They do leave some degrees of residues behind. Um, things like easy off uh, or easy, easy street, barn take it off, these kind of products, while they don't cause damage, these things are not, they don't cause damage to the rollers. They don't really necessarily cause swelling, so to speak. Uh, but what they do is they, they, they're essentially uh, hand soap or, or liquid type soaps, detergents, and they leave a lot of residues behind. And while they do a good job of taking us from a black to a yellow on press, they, they leave a lot of residues behind that at some point we're going to have to deal with. So these are the kind of things that come in to play on the rollers that we consider insoluble. So how do we remove them? Um, the first to use a cleaner that's designed for rubber rollers. We don't use things like easy off oven cleaner or uh, carburetor cleaner or things of that nature. I've seen, uh, seen things in a press room that, that would make most of us shake our heads, uh, but it actually does occur. People think that they can clean the rollers with all kinds of different things, but use something that's designed for a rubber roller. Uh, use a cleaner that's designed to remove the insoluble particle, otherwise it's not going to go away and we're just going to be stuck with it. So just regular roller washes or aggressive roller washes won't do the trick. Uh, use a cleaner that's safe. Okay, that's a big one. We know that uh, printing's based on, you know, back in the years and years ago, we used to use a lot of things in press rooms that weren't always the safest things in the world. But uh, today's, today's market we can see and, and know and understand what we're using. Use something that's safe. Big red ladders, if, something, if you're going to take something away today, take this one away. Don't use a cleaner with grit. Um, we used to use a product called Putz Pomade, or there was a lot of press rooms, even still in today's world, that I see around the country that have a lot of pumice so that, and, you know, in, in the press rooms, and people are, think that they can use those to scrub the rollers with and, and get a better surface on them or whatever it may be. While they do remove glaze, they, they scrub the glaze right away, but you're also removing... Um, the mountaintops, you know, just scrubbing the mountaintops. It's almost like using sandpaper or steel wool on the roller. Scrubs the mountaintops right away, gets them down to the valley floors, and then uh, 
then we have no ability to carry ink and water balance again. So we're back to how important the surface is. And so don't ever use grit. What we recommend, we recommend our paste. Um, it's our Feeble Clean 2000 paste. It's, uh, this product's been around for a very long time. Uh, correct way to use this is every press, every unit, every week. And basically what that means is on Friday night after the last shift has ran and it's done and they wash the press up, uh, wash the press completely up, the rollers are clean and they're dry, take the Febo Clean Paste, tap it on like you would an in ink, about the same amount to ink up a printing unit, maybe two ounces or so per unit, depending on the size of the unit. Uh, run it in the rollers for five minutes or so, make sure that it's evenly distributed throughout the roller train, shut the press off and leave it until Monday morning. Just let it sit in the press all weekend. That's how it's best used. That's how it's going to dig into the roller. It's going to dig deep down into the, the nap of the roller, into the valley of the roller, pull those insolubles out, the things that are underneath it, and then it can be washed away, and we've got a nice new surface on our roller. Um, people complain with Feeble Clean a couple of different ways. They use it. If they've never used it before, the rollers are eight, nine months old, and they try to do this over the weekend, uh, the first thing that happens, they call me on Monday, say, yeah, you know, the Feeble Clean dried up and I can't get it out of my press. What do I do? Well, the Feeble Clean did not dry up. Feeble Clean cannot dry up. There's nothing in it that would allow it to do that. Um, the, what did dry up, though, is all the stuff that was down in the nap of the roller that the Feeble Clean actually pulled out, pulled it out to the top and it kind of recrusts over the top of the Feeble paste, and then that, that's what turns to the black looking tar. It's hard to get off. So the best way to remove that is just tap a little more Febo on, let it run for four or five minutes, and then wash it out with hot water and solvent, and that should uh, should correct the problem. Um, last thing that, that we're going to deal with here as far as a wash-up is concerned would be calcium. A lot of times people will use uh, Febo Clean, and the rollers will come clean, everything will look great, but the rollers look like they have spray powder or dust on them, and that is the calcium particles that are being left behind. Um, calcium is such a hard, heavy particle, the only way to get rid of that would be with a heavy acid. So we have to be very careful how often and in what manner we're using these type of products. There's a lot of different calcium removers out on the marketplace today. Uh, most of them are very thin, um, almost like water, and they can create issues by, by misting and dripping or spitting off in places that they shouldn't. And what I mean by that is coming off the ends of the rollers, it can get on the, the bearings the journals and the shafts and housings out on the ends of the rollers, and that can create real damage if we're not real careful. We have a product that we call Calcium Fix. Our Calcium Fix is also a heavy acid, but it's also a gel, which makes ours a little bit different than most things that are out there. Um, so two beads across the roller, three minutes on the press, and then wash it off with lots of hot water. That's how you use the Calcium Fix. Um, so that's, that's, our, uh, that's our answer to getting the rollers really clean, really deep clean. And... Uh, so our cleaning suggestions is it really is, is uh, let the solution work into the solvent or into the inks. Um, let the let the roller wash get through the roller train. It'll start to break the viscosity of the inks down a little bit. They'll thin out a little bit. They'll come clean a little bit faster. Um, uh, after that, um, it's going to provide also a little bit of lubrication to the to the rollers themselves, so that when the blade is engaged, it doesn't destroy the blade. Which is point number two: keep your wash up blades like new. Uh, I see people all the time take their wash-up blades, and I'm always asking, do you clean those every time you use them? Yep, everyone always says they clean them every time. And that's great. They look good. They look clean. There's new rags in the bottom of the pans and those kind of things. But we turn around, we look at the back side of those blades, and, and there's ink back there and probably enough to print a job or two. Um, but uh, the back side of that printing, or that, that wash-up blade, is the only part that does any work. That's the part that actually contacts the roller. So while we're cleaning our blades, that's great, but we need to look at the back side. It'll tell us, are they worn out on one side versus the other side? Is it chipped or cracked or broken? Uh, these are the things that we're looking for to see if we need a new blade or not. So that's highly important to keep the blades like new. Take your time to clean. When I ran press rooms and managed press rooms, I used to tell people in my, in my press room, look, I'd rather you do one 10-minute wash-up as two 7-minute wash-ups any day of the week. Uh, you just saved me four minutes. Four minutes doesn't seem like a lot of time until you start to think about what that can mean over the course of a year. So if you take four minutes and you multiply it by every unit of every press in the press room and you multiply that by every shift of every day of every week of every month for an entire year, four minutes is, 
turns into be hours at the end of that year. And then those hours, what do we do? Do we get more break time or more more uh, off time, so to speak? Nope. We can actually print more jobs. Gives us more throughput in our press room. Makes us a little more profitable. We didn't really do a whole lot to change our lives other than we did things uh, the way they should be done to begin with. And those, that's important in my mind to to add money at the bottom line of our press rooms. That's something small that we can do. Try the two-third, one-third method. This is something that I didn't really put in the seminar, but we can talk about it very briefly. Uh, basically, when we're washing up our press, if we're doing it in a manual way, we're only going to apply the roller wash to two-thirds of the width of the roller train at one time, and then we alternate sides each time we reapply our solvents. And that whole idea there is that last third of the roller uh, will keep the rollers turning. Uh, if the rollers are not turning, they're not cleaning. End of story. Um, so we need to uh, make sure that the rollers are constantly turning while we're washing our press up. Um, we've all washed a press up before, put the solvents on, and the top side of the rollers stop turning. If they're not turning, they're not cleaning. So we need to keep them turning. So we'll try the two-third, one-third method sometime. Don't forget those insolubles. That's our, our Fibo Clean and uh, also the, the calcium removers. Um, again, it's not on there, but in big red letters, don't, don't ever use grit on a press. So swelling and shrinking, rollers, are, rollers do change size. That, that is for certain. Uh, the older a roller gets, um, the roller will shrink. This is where the plasticizer comes into play when we talk about the oils that are in rollers. Uh, any type of rubber, no matter what type of rubber it is, uh, whatever kind of rubber we're talking about, whether it be a printing roller, whether it be a, a screwdriver handle, or even a car tire, they all have these plasticizers in them. They all have oil in them. Eventually, over the course of time, the oil, because they are liquid state, will leach out. They will come out as, as the rubber ages. Um, and that's why a roller shrinks. That's why a roller ages, and eventually we have to, to, to replace it. So our job as a rubber formulator, as far as Botcher is concerned, is to make rubber formulas from all that ingredient list and recipe list we've seen earlier uh, and come up with formulas or, or recipes to, that will lock in the plasticizer, form crosslinks, um, and lock in the plasticizer in the roller so that it doesn't come out and the roller lasts a very long time. Um, and that's what we do in our labs in Germany. So uh, this is where we come up with our rubber formulas. We come up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 different rubber formulas per year. Um, to give you an idea, we keep our, our lab coats quite busy over in Germany. So only one or two of those rubber, rubber compounds or formulas ever, ever see the light of day. But uh, that's why a roller will shrink. So when we think about it, rollers change size, what's happening, and this is what we're talking about, the heat extracts plasticizer, because when a roller flexes, anytime it hits another roller or a nip point uh, or a plate, uh, the rubber flexes and the molecules on the inside, they rub against one another. It's friction, basically, and it creates heat. Heat's the single biggest reason rollers fail. The higher the heat, the faster the roller will fail, because our cross links will break down. They're like little rubber bands. The hotter the... The, the higher the heat goes, the faster the little rubber bands will break down and then the rubber will fall apart. If we keep the heat very low, then our rollers stay together for a very long time. So uh, our, if our formulas are good, which we know that they are, then it becomes uh, uh, our job in a press room to see that they don't get overheated. Um, it's easy to do that. We, have, we see general operating temperatures on a printing roller, internal temperatures uh, anywhere from 110 to 114 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you get to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, you've done irreparable damage to the roller. Um, so the window is pretty small. That's why we don't run dry. We always use roller lube if we're going to run the rollers dry. Um, that, uh, that's that's a, a, a quick and easy way to keep the heat as low as possible. So the only reason a roller will swell or go the other direction is flat out an aromatic type hydrocarbon solvent, which will weaken the cross links. They'll make the molecules fat and puffy. They look like this. Um, because the, 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 the uh, solvents and residues are diffusing down into the rubber. They're basically pushing the plasticizer out of the rollers, and they, become, they make the crosslinks very weak. They become puffy, uh, and they rupture very easily. Uh, chemical damaged roller is fairly easy to tell. It looks like it has pitting, almost like craters from the moon on it. Um, that's, a, that's a very good indication that we've had a chemical problem. Most of the time, it's, it's because we're using a roller wash that, that has a, too much swell uh, characteristic, too much aromatic hydrocarbon content. 
um, or we're using something and we're not rinsing it off properly. In other words, we're not using enough water to keep the rovers clean. So that's another reason that we use water, water, water at the end of our rover washes. So a rower changing size or major causes are harsh solvents and inks, and that's things like UV inks or harsh solvents that maybe we've not tested. We don't know what they're going to create, create cause issues. Solvent saturation, that's basically solvent that's being left over past the wash-up. Um, we turn our press off and we look at the back of the printing units, inch that backwards. Uh, if the rollers are coming back around wet or damp, then we know that we're leaving wash or solvent in the, in the nip points, and that's going to saturate in there and create issues for us, so we have to be careful of that. Fountain solution is a very technical one, but fountain solutions, uh, because of their chemical makeup, uh, it can create lots of issues. Um, depending on what they are. Uh, fountain solutions are primarily made from acetic acid or they're made from citric acid. Um, so we have to be careful of how much acid contents are in them. This gets uh, really kind of crazy and quite technical all at once. So uh, just be aware of the fountain solutions and what can happen on a, especially on a, a pan roller that's soaked in the fountain solution all the time. It can create things like orange peel or swell rings. Uh, so those are indications that our fountain solutions are not working well with the rubber. Uh, temperature we've already pretty much covered, so we have to be careful of that, keep the temperatures as low as possible. And raw rubber cover, that's my job and that's our salespeople's job out in the field. Most 99% of all of our salespeople are very technical. They've all came from press rooms, um, but it's our jobs to take a look at your conditions, your environments, and come up with a covering um, that's actually designed to fit for your needs. Our, our suggestion with chemistry is this, check with us first. If you get something new in your press room, something that you've not ran before, maybe someone comes in, oh, it's, this is the latest and the greatest, uh, or maybe it's really cheap and we can save money over the course of the year, let us check it for you first. Um, we'll, we'll look through our database. If, our, if, if we've tested it before, we'll have the data on it. Our database is very old. It's been around. Uh, for almost 50 years, we've been building this database, so it's, uh, it's pretty extensive. But if our data is old, if uh, you have a brand new chemical that we've not tested before, something that we've not seen before, we don't know what's going on, or if there's problems that are occurring you know, in the press room, let us test your chemistry. Um, we will do this, and we will do this always at no charge. Um, you just collect the chemistry samples, you get them to us, we'll take them to our lab in Michigan and we'll do uh, swell data testing on them and let you know what the, what the results of that will be. Don't test chemistry on your press. Um, we all know that rollers are not cheap. Um, they're a very expensive part of our process and we need to understand what's happening with them. We don't want to test roll the dice, so to speak, with, uh, with a chemistry that we know nothing about that's going to go on our press, uh, thinking we might save ourselves a little bit of money here and there when in turn we can ruin an entire set of rollers. That can become very expensive. So let us do the testing for you. It's always free. Roller settings. Um, roller adjustments should be backed off before inserting new rollers. And that's simple because the new rollers will be larger than the old rollers. Why? Because we know that the old rollers, as they age, uh, they're losing plasticizer. The roller shrinks a little bit. So they have to back our settings off uh, before we move forward to get the new ones in. At the bottom, this is a really key one, rollers should be set by coming forward into contact with any surface. Uh, what that essentially means is this. It means that any time you set roller stripes, the last move you make, the stripe should get bigger. Always bigger, never smaller, because we're increasing the load up the roller and that will maintain the roller setting, um, as opposed to backing the stripe from a six, say, millimeters down to a five millimeters and stopping. Uh, the, the rollers go up and down and on and off pressure, those, that, that load will change on the rubber and that stripe will change. So always make the stripe bigger uh, at our last move. Uh, you'll only see three stripe settings in a press at any one time. You'll see an uneven setting. There's never, ever any condition that would require an uneven setting on any roller in any press. Uh, always set it, reset it until it's even all the way across. The second one is a bowed setting. That means it looks like a little cigar or something like that. Okay, this is not possible for us to actually manufacture a roller to look that way unless it's a water meter roller for, say, a Heidelberg. Um, we don't put those in, in that machine. It's ran on a CNC C, uh, lathe, and, and we don't put ink rollers in there. But this is always a form roller. And when I get this phone call, uh, it's 
set too tight to the opposite hard roller. In other words, probably the hard oscillator roller behind it. There's just too much back pressure there, which is creating a few things. One, it's making the core want to bow slightly, which is going to create this look of uh, a stripe. Um, it's going to let the uh, bearings and journals, housings, these things are going to start to give way a little bit, start to collapse or release a little bit, and it's going to create pressure in the middle. Also, it's, uh, it's a condition where we get too much back pressure on the roller from the hard roller that's immovable, and that will create and allow the rubber to bulge around the core of the roller, which will make the, the middle look fat. So back it off from that hard roller, that opposite uh, oscillator roller, reset it, and everything should be fine. The last setting you'll see is the high-low setting. Two or three inches from the end, um, fades away to nothing in the middle. Uh, that's the strike that we're actually looking for over the course of time. That's, that means that the roller is worn out and it's time for new rollers. A bigger strike means more energy. It's just more force on the journal center press. It's more energy to run the press, kilowatts per hour. The rollers run hotter. Remember, that's our enemy. That's the single biggest reason that they fail. It's like driving a car with your foot on the brake or driving with underinflated tires. And we all know that uh, with underinflated tires, it kills our gas mileage in our car, and that's simply because there's just more of a contact patch between the, the rubber and the road, and it takes more energy to make the car go down the road, which is our gas mileage. It's just the same thing with our printing rollers. The more stripe pressure you have between the two rollers, that's more contact patch between the rollers, in turn means more energy and more heat and uh, more cost to run the press. We actually conducted this experiment. We did this experiment on a two-color press. It was a small machine. Uh, ran this press for two, month, two full months before we ever ran the first sheet. We went in and set everything at six millimeters throughout. Uh, we ran the press. We measured our power usage, kilowatts per hour to run the press. And our, we measured our fountain solution and our ink usage. Um, at the end of 30 days, everything was stopped. We reset all the roller stripes from six millimeters. We cut them all down to three millimeters and we continued to run for another full 30 days. We did the same experiment, measured our power usage and, and our ink and our fountain solution. First thing we realized by doing this experiment was almost a 60% savings just in electricity to run the machine, and that's just by backing roller stripes off. We also saved 27% in ink, and we saved 15% savings in fountain solution. Now, those numbers are huge. Um, we could consider, let's say, that, that our testing and our environment was maybe a little bit extreme. Let's say that we even were, were off by 50%. But I know everybody in here can kind of figure out what their electric bill for their press room is for one year and what kind of ink they spend in one year and how much money they spend in fountain solution in one year. And if you save 30% in your electric bill, you save 15% in your ink bill, and you save 7 or 8% in your fountain solution, where does that money go? That money goes to the bottom line. We didn't do a single thing differently on a day-to-day -day basis, but yet we had an immediate impact on the bottom line of our company. And that is our job on a daily basis. But only one day when we set roller stripes, we back the settings off by 50%. That's all we did. Even a, even a half a millimeter, even a half a millimeter will make a difference. A half a millimeter off a stripe setting can have a major impact overall in our press rooms. So we have to be aware of, of that. How, how can we back the roller stripes off by, by even a half a millimeter or a millimeter from roller to roller? It will have a big big impact. Use stripe gauges. Um, all of your salespeople have stripe gauges uh, available. Um, if you do not have them for your press room, if you don't have enough, uh, get one for everybody in the press room. Uh, just ask your local sales guy for the stripe gauges, and we can certainly get those to you. It takes away all of the guesswork. Check it once on either end, once in the center. The three should look the same, and away we go. Uh, makes things smooth and easy. We don't have to guess uh, what what it is. Is it a four millimeter or is it a five millimeter? And if it's in between, then it's probably a four and a half. So the stripe gauges take all the guesswork out of our stripe setting. So excessive roller contact destroys our rubber, our bearings, journal shafts, and housings. It reduces our printing capabilities. It causes color variation, certainly, because of the heat that's generated, breaks the viscosity of our ink down, changes our, our ink and water pickup ratios, and we have real issues there, increases our electric bills. We say this set them as light as possible. 
and that means if you can back them off open a half a millimeter, that's a good thing. We believe in this so much, we put little blue ribbons around this part of it because it is true. It is, it is certainly, if you want your rollers to last a very long time uh, and print as, as well as possible, we back them off slightly. And look at the next slide is the golden rule. You can imagine, set them as light as possible by all means. Um, again, um, you can carry that too far. I did this seminar for a shop in New York uh, so about 10 years ago, I believe, and uh, a guy called me two weeks later and said, you know, I had some a bit of an issue with the golden rule there, setting them as light as possible. I said, why? He says, well, I went out in the press room this morning, and we had three press operators standing around the press. They couldn't figure out why the four rollers were not taking ink. So the rollers do have to touch. We can back them off so far that they don't touch, and then we have real issues. The rollers last a very long time at that point, but we don't print very well. So set them as light as possible. The transfer is what we're after, but if you can back them off even a half a millimeter, that's a fantastic thing. So in summary, clean your rollers, your frequency and technique. Uh, that's important, um, making sure that we do the feeble cleanings on a weekly basis. Uh, the technique, uh, we didn't cover it a lot, but the two-third, one-third method, we can expand on that if we'd like. Um, bearings and journals, we didn't talk about those, but we certainly can. If, if we like, most of our rollers out there are press ready, so it's not something that you definitely have to worry about too much. Um, lighten up on the pressure settings, again, that's our golden rule. We believe in that 100%. Test your chemistry before you use it. That's not always a free thing from us. Uh, can our results of, of this will all be consistent in high quality printing and less color variation, uh, less downtime, longer roller life. How do we beat the roller enemies? We beat our roller enemies through proper installation and proper settings and proper cleaning. And I certainly, certainly appreciate all of your time. And uh, I open it up for questions. So feel free to. Uh ask uh, Dan any questions that you might have. So Dan, it looks like uh, you did a pretty, pretty thorough job here because uh, Everybody uh, uh, looks like they, they got the message. Uh, last uh, last kind of time for, uh, for any questions before we wrap up for the day. If, if you do come across questions um, later on or, or otherwise, you can, you can always email us. Uh, you can ask your local sales rep. Um, if you'd like a, a roller seminar that's, that's the same seminar but expands a lot more, covers a lot more things, a lot more in depth. Let us know by all means, just get together with our local guys and, and we can cover this. But uh, we do highly value our, our relationship with GAA and all of your press rooms. And again, we, we certainly thank you for the time and, and the ability to, to stop here and, and do a little bit of training for you guys. Great, so ne next week in the, um, in the newsletter, um, I will um, have, um, Dan's contact information as well as Lauren's contact information in there um, and then the link for the, the webinar um, if anybody wants to show uh, any of their employees um, the, uh, the webinar it'll be available and we'll have it available so you can you can uh, revisit it at any time and uh, Dan we'd, we'd, we'd certainly like to uh, to thank you for your time great presentation today um, Lauren thanks certainly. for um, uh, making this uh, Dan available to us we, we do have one question um, okay. Steve, Steve is asking is hot water best or just room temperature water my preference is is warm water um, you can use water that is too hot um, I, I watched a press guy one time try to use water that was he was getting directly from a coffee maker uh, that's that's certainly too hot again uh, keep the temperatures below that 110 or 100 degree mark, but warm water certainly I feel like does a much better job. Uh, it'll break the gums down a lot faster if it's a little warm. Uh, it's not always the case if you're using an automatic system, but certainly by hand if you if you have the ability to use warm water, um, certainly uh, in my opinion is best. But uh, excellent question, Steve. Thank you. Uh, Dan, what's the best way to store rollers? 
Uh, that's a good question. People ask me that all the time. People say, are they best to be stored upright or on their side? In our opinion, it doesn't make any difference. Um, you can store the roller upright or on its side. Basically, store the roller in the box that it comes in. Um, the roller is suspended inside the box, which means that it's not sitting flat or against another uh, flat or hard surface, which is going to create hard uh, flat spots, which can create long-term problems for the roller. Um, if we're running a big machine and they're in crates as they come in, I would just leave them in the crates. They're suspended on saddles. Um, I certainly would recommend looking inside of the crates to see that nothing has fallen off in shipment. Um, some of the LTL carriers and things of that nature are not always uh, the, the easiest on, on transport, so things do move around, but I would take a look. As long as they're suspended, we're in good shape. Um, old roller companies used to say, oh, you wanted to always store the rollers upright, and then every three months they wanted you to flip them over. And they would tell you that because they knew that the rubber compounds were very poor and they would sag and they would droop and they would never want you to hang them on the wall in a, in a horizontal position because the rubber would droop. But uh, our compounds are such that they do not do that. Um, so either way, upright or on their side is fine. The best thing to do is to keep them wrapped up um, in, a, in a darker environment I think is always best um, and, and maintaining constant temperature for the roller. That's, that's always best. All right, last, uh, last chance for any other any questions for Dan. All right, well, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, uh, uh, Botcher, for, uh, for the great, uh, great presentation, and uh, thanks for um, joining us today. Thank you. Take care, people. All right. Bye-bye.